Yeah, here at the uh, NRL office in Sydney now with Paul Hepton Stall, who is the senior NRL wellbeing and education manager. Um, Paul, first of all, thank you for um, having us here. You know, the, the rugby league uh, staff and you know discussing all things wellbeing. I know over the last few years we've had the opportunity to come over to, yep. to the NRL and speak to you. And, you know, I personally thank you as well for everything you've uh, you, you've, you've done for us and all the advice you've given. Um, just a bit of a summary of what what your role is and what your day-to-day work is. Um, well, it's probably similar to yours, Steve. Um, it, the broader approach around well-being. I, I'm the scene as so I've been the manager here for the NRL for 15 or 16 years now. Uh, after spending a bit of time at a couple of the clubs, um, and it's really just to um, keep growing the support for the athletes in all areas outside of their football. And we know that a lot of the stuff that we do in wellbeing will help their football, but um, it, A, it's a duty of care, but it's also the right thing to do to make sure that players are, are developed beyond the football field and um, a more balanced person is a better player, that's what we always say. So, um, uh, But I'm very fortunate that the game between the NRL and the Players Association have invested in, in wellbeing and uh, it's my my role and responsibility to make sure that's, that we're best practice, and that's why it's really good to share things that you're doing uh, in England because a lot of our players will come and go and uh, we'll get some of your players here and uh, so it's really good to share things between the sports. Brilliant. And I know you've um, you've been part of, or you've been in this role for a number of years now and um, you've seen the evolution of this space and, and well-being education mm-hmm. and you know, how, how's that come about, you know, what, um, what have been the you know, the major wins in this area yeah. and, and the importance of, of making sure that it's constantly evolving. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question because I, I mean, I think our, our game sort of really only went professional at the end of, or towards the end of the 90s and I'm probably showing my age here, of being around then, it was, um, we saw players give up their jobs overnight to become professional players, professional football players and and it was probably only the early two, 2000s where we realised that you know, we'd had a lot of players that never had any work experience in anything other than football in their whole life. So we felt like it was a real duty of care to, to look after them. And I think in some of those early years, we were more of a safety net when, yeah. when to be there to help people when, when they struggled. Um, but I think we've really evolved into being a lot more proactive. And a big part of that is trying to make sure that we, well, we virtually insist that players have something with them to grow their identity outside being a footballer because we know that everyone's going to retire at some stage. You're going to get injured, you're going to get suspended and most won't ever make a dollar playing rugby league. So this, the importance of creating this identity for yourself outside of being a footballer is really important. And that flows on to someone's holistic well-being, um, you know, around um, you know their values and how they see themselves as a person and you know, the good relationships they have in their life, you know, caring for money and how to look after money and uh, and and also, you know, if things in their life like spirituality or the culture or the involvement in the community, they're, they're really, if they're really important to a person, we've got to make sure we really support that as well. So, um, so the game, yeah, the role of wellbeing, as you would know, has, has really evolved and <clears throat> I think it's more from a really proactive side of things. Um, I think the other really pleasing thing is I think in the early days we were seen as a, a sort of a welfare support type program, but but I think um, I think we've really grown into clubs, football departments where they're, they're the, the the coaches and the football managers and the CEOs really value what we do because we know that we are a real protective measure for those players and the clubs, and and we know that if a player is involved in some sort of career development off the field or are proactive with their well-being that they're less likely to get in trouble, they're going to have a longer career, we know they're going to make more money um, and their transition is going to be a lot smoother. So there's no there's no real downside to what we do in well-being. So um, I think, you know, while we're still, we've got to push barriers, um, I think we've moved a long way and as I said, you know, the Super League are probably a really good example of especially the last couple of years, been really progressive in what you're doing. So, um, you know, we're, we're learning off each other in that way. Yeah, I think I think the key has been a real collaborative approach between both competitions. And we've got a lot of, of NRL um, players coming over to obviously play in the UK. That's always happened. But what we're now seeing is a lot of our younger players and, and, and our current players coming over to play in the NRL. You know, some, some recently both 
in the men's game and the women's game and you know, so I think the sharing all that best practice is, is crucial for, for, for both of us and just one thing which is really interesting is, is the really began young players and education and um, you know just what can give us a little bit more of an insight into, uh, into that, uh, that provision. Yeah, well, we we used to have a national youth competition where it was a no work, no study, no play policy. Um, I suppose a bit like the the university system in the states where you had to maintain a certain grade point average. But we um, <clears throat> it actually really had a lot of traction. So we had a lot of players, you know, being really engaged in off field activities. And when we dissolved the national youth competition, we wanted to have that same rule for the professional players. That didn't matter whether you're on. 50,000 or 500,000, we, we actually made the rule to say that if, you, if you're not doing something one day a week, we, we can't let you play. And, and, um, and fortunate enough, we haven't, been able, we haven't stood anyone down, um, but, it is, but it is a rule. And we know that it's just for the best interest of the play. It doesn't have to be something too onerous, but it's just something outside the game which can grow their identity, grow this this this, this self esteem, this this sort of purpose outside of footy, which we know will help their footy, and and I think all the clubs have really um, have really supported it, and um, and we hope if in those first couple of years, if we can get them on the pathway, then their their time management and the players' perception of how important it is will continue, and they'll just they'll just do that for the for the whole career.